black body radiation, the photoelectric effect, and the de Broglie relation are going to be the topics of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, at the end of the 19th century, some physicists thought we had a pretty good handle on describing our physical world, that maybe that all was left to the world of physics was just to refine the measurements of some of the physical constants. Well, it couldn't have been more wrong, because at the uh, initiation of the 20th century, we found out that there were some phenomena like black body radiation and the photoelectric effect that classical theory just couldn't explain. We were on the precipice of the quantum revolution, which shows that at the small level, at kind of the atomic scale, the world is very different than the classical world we experience on the macro scale. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, we're going to start by taking a look at the shortcomings of classical theory to explain black body radiation. Now, black body is just simply one that absorbs all incident radiation, and then the characteristic radiation it emits is purely a function of its temperature. So, and this serves as the basis for kind of our infrared thermometers. So we can tell based on the max wavelength that's being emitted, what temperature that particular black body radiation corresponds to. So if we take a look at our, our typical observations on a plot of intensity versus wavelength, we can kind of see a couple different temperatures what we actually observe. So, and I've just kind of, kind of marked lower and higher, and you can see that as you increase the temperature, so intensities go up and things of this sort, but also, so wavelengths, kind of the max wavelength in particular, goes to a lower wavelength at higher temperatures. Now, classical theory, which viewed light as purely wave-like in nature, follows this lovely curve in purple here, so which doesn't do a bad job at long wavelengths. It, it actually matches pretty closely. But as we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, it kind of starts to deviate more and more until you get to the point where you start reaching kind of the end of the spectrum where you hit the ultraviolet region, and then it completely fails. Because once you reach the ultraviolet region, we see we hit a maximum in the intensity, and then what we really observe for black body radiation is that it then approaches zero, so the intensity approaches zero as the wavelength approaches zero. But our classical theory should have the intensity approaching infinity as the wavelength approaches zero. And they dubbed this the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now it turns out a guy by the name of Max Planck, famous in his own right, came up with an idea. He said, what if these black bodies are composed of harmonic resonators, now we refer to them as harmonic oscillators, that have characteristic energies. And these energies only exist as multiples of HF. So where N is an integer here. Now, he didn't have like a theoretical reason why it had to be this way, other than the fact that if he made this assumption, the equations he derived out of it matched exactly what we see for black body radiation. And the idea is that the energies of these oscillators only existed at certain quantities. That is the heart of quantum mechanics. It's that only certain quantities of energy are possible. And so for these harmonic oscillators, just multiples, again, where n is any integer, of hf. That, again, is the crux of quantum mechanics. So, and this might not seem revolutionary, but if you think of trying to apply this to anything in our macro world, and I like to think of myself as having a quantum car. And in my quantum car, if I put it into first gear, so, and it's a manual transmission, obviously, but if I put it into first gear, it goes 10 miles an hour. If I put it into second gear, it goes 20 miles an hour. Third gear, 30 miles an hour. Fourth gear, 40 miles an hour. And those are the only speeds my quantum car ever goes. When I shift from first gear to second gear, it's not like the car speeds up from 10 miles an hour up to 20 miles an hour and then plateaus. It instantaneously changes its speed from 10 to 20. It never has to go through 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 20. It never speeds up. It instantaneously changes because those intermediate speeds are not even possible for this quantum car. The only speeds you'll ever observe this car going are 10, 20, 30, and 40, and nothing in between. Notice nothing in our world look, you know, works like this. We have a continuous spectrum of possible speeds for this car. And as it speeds up and slows down, we go through all of those to multiple decibel points if we want to measure it out and things of this sort. So the fact that only certain quantities of energy were possible, this was revolutionary. And people thought that Max Planck was out of his mind for proposing this, but it matched the data. So, and he kind of kicked off this quantum revolution here. 
That was the first crack. The second one is what we saw with the photoelectric effect, and Einstein made a big contribution here, as we'll see. So the photoelectric effect is the name we give to the process of shining light on a metal and watch electrons be ejected from the metal as a result. And once again, classical theory failed to explain some of the observations we make. Now it turns out a classical theory where light was merely a wave, well, the energy of a wave should be completely dependent upon the amplitude of the wave, which is related to the intensity of the wave. And so a greater the intensity of a light wave, well, that would correspond to a brighter beam of light, if you will. Well, the problem was, is that's not what the data said. So if we look at kind of what's going on here with the photoelectric effect, so what you found is that the energy was related to the frequency instead. And it turns out it didn't matter how intense the beam was, if it was below a certain threshold frequency somewhere over here, no electrons would be ejected whatsoever. But once you reach this threshold frequency, you could have the least intense beam possible, but you'd start seeing electrons ejected. And so all of a sudden, the energy wasn't related to the intensity, but somehow it ended up being related to this frequency. In fact, as you increase the frequency beyond that threshold frequency, you'd start seeing greater and greater maximum kinetic energy from those electrons. They'd be being ejected with greater velocity, if you will, more kinetic energy. And so somehow as frequency was going up, so Einstein proposed that the energy of the light was going up as well. So causing the interaction with these electrons that are being ejected to have more energy as well. And so what he described was that light was not merely wave-like in nature, it was also particle-like in nature. And so instead of being a continuous wave, it came in discrete packets. You might think of them as kind of like light bullets. And he called these light bullets photons. So in the energy of these photons, was equal to HF, and so that's Planck's constant right there. Planck's constant showed up in black body radiation, if you recall as well. So the same constant becoming relevant over here in this application as well. So let great, led great credence to the fact that it was actually uh, an accurate description of nature. We can also write this in terms of the speed of light and the wavelength as well. And so as frequency goes up, energy goes up, and this explains the curve right here. Now it turns out this threshold frequency. So it turns out that every metal has a characteristic what we call work function. And that's the minimum amount of energy to get that electron kind of off that metal. And if you give light with exactly that amount of energy, that's when you start seeing electrons ejected. And if you give it photons with even more energy, any remaining energy can be given to the electrons as kinetic energy. And so if the photons have higher energy, you start having greater kinetic energy of those uh, ejected electrons exactly explaining the observations we make with this lovely curve. So if you look at the equation we derive from this curve right here, the way it works is we take a look at the maximum kinetic energy of the ejected electrons is gonna equal the energy of the photons minus what we call a characteristic work function. And that work function, again, is characteristic of whatever metal you're talking about. And you can think of it as the threshold energy just to get, you know, peel an electron off that particular metal. And so if you look at what's going on here, if you hit, if the energy of the photon is less than the work function, you're not going to get an ejected electron. So, uh, but what you, what you find out is when you reach this threshold right here, when the energy of the photon is equal to the work function, so you get an ejected electron with effectively zero kinetic energy. But let's say you hit, uh, you know, the, the metal with a photon of even higher energy. All of a sudden now, then anything over the work function, so, the electron has the potential to retain that as kinetic energy. That's kind of the way this works. So let's take a look at an example problem. So question here says, what is the minimum frequency and maximum wavelength of light that will result in electron being ejected from gold? And then we're given the work function for gold as 5.1 electron volts. And we're given Planck's constant as 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules. Now you might recall that electron volts is just another measure of energy. You can convert back and forth between joules and electron volts. In fact, it might be helpful if you remember that one electron volt is the same as 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. It is the energy required to accelerate an electron, which has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, so through a one volt potential difference. All right, so from here, if we want that minimum frequency, that threshold frequency, once again, that happens 
right when kinetic energy equals zero, which occurs right when the energy of the photon HF is equal to the work function. So in this case, we want to set HF equal to that work function so that the frequency is going to equal the work function over Planck's constant. Uh, so in this case, so again, our work function is 5.1 electron volts. We could convert this to electron volts or convert this to joules. I'm going to choose to convert electron volts to joules here. So in this case, we're going to have one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Cancel out our electron volts and then divide it all by Planck's constant. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. That'll cancel out the joules. We'll have units of one over seconds or per seconds or hertz, just as we should for a frequency. So from here, we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting here. So 5.1 times 1.6 E, i.e. times 10 to the negative 19, divided by 6.626 E, i.e. times 10 to the negative 34. And rounded to two sig figs, I'm going to get 1.23 times 10 to the 15, sir. so 1.2. times 10 to the 15th seconds to the minus one, or hertz, if you will. So and then you might recall that frequency times wavelength equals the speed of light. So therefore, the wavelength would equal the speed of light over the frequency, which would be 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, all over this 1.2 times 10 to the 15th per second. Let's make sure that looks a little better. That's a five. All right, the per seconds are going to cancel and the units are going to come out in meters here. So and I'm going to use the entire, instead of 1.2 times 10 to the 15th, I'll use the entire answer that's in my calculator, but we'll just take 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by that last answer. And in this case, 2.436 times 10 to the minus 7. So to two sig figs, that'd be 2.4 times 10 to the minus 7. Times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Or you might see that also written as 240 nanometers. So now Einstein had demonstrated that light had both wave-like and particle-like characteristics, that it had both a wave-like and a particle-like nature. Well, then de Broglie here, and it looks like de Broglie, I've been corrected, it actually is pronounced de Broglie, it's a French name. So de Broglie here came along, and in his PhD thesis, he proposed, well, if light could be not only wave-like, but also particle-like in its nature, then maybe matter is not only particle-like, but also wave-like in its nature as well. So there's kind of this symmetry in nature. And it turns out he was correct, but he derived it, again, once again, using Planck's constant, that the wavelength of matter was equal to Planck's constant divided by the mass in kilograms and the velocity in meters per second. And so even matter, you and I and, and everything you see, has a characteristic wavelength. The problem is when you start dealing with objects with very large masses, the wavelength is so small as to be uh, imperceptible. And so for anything on a macro scale, its wavelength is too tiny to even be measured. But when you look at electrons, it turns out we can actually talk about the wavelength associated with electrons. In fact, we describe where electrons live, if you will, in the coming lessons as wave functions. So, but it turns out he was totally right and he didn't have to wait too long before we started observing that things like electrons that are, that are very small have characteristic wavelengths right along with this theory. Now it turns out this was part of his PhD thesis defense and those who were on his defense committee, they didn't know what to make of this. It wasn't very long, it was only a couple of pages long and they didn't know what to make of it. So what they did is they sent him out of the room and then they sent his thesis defense off to Einstein and said, can you make any heads or tails of this? Because we don't know what's going on here. So, and it turns out Einstein's like, wow, the guy's brilliant. Give him his PhD and then send him to me. <laughs> so, but in this case, he was smarter than those on his PhD thesis uh, or defense committee, uh, which is a story I kind of like. All right, so we can use this simply in a plug and chug, and that's what we're going to do here. And, uh, and in this case, the question is, what is the wavelength of an electron? And the key is now that we're talking about matter, I should clue you in you're using the de Broglie relation to find the wavelength of matter, not light. So, but what is the wavelength of an electron having a velocity of 1.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second? And the mass of the electron is given in parentheses as 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And from there, it's going to be simple plug and chug. So, once again, we have that Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Mass has to be in kilograms, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 
kilograms times that velocity given of 1.0 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. And we'll let our calculator once again do the heavy lifting here. So in this case, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 divided by, and I'll put some parentheses up there, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times 1 times 10 to the sixth, close my parentheses, and we're going to get 7.27, which I'll round up to 7.3 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So it turns out this is super tiny, but it is measurable. So whereas, you know, you or I, when we're moving down the street, we're so large that we might have a wavelength like on the order of like 10 to the minus 40 meters or something like that, which is completely unmeasurable. But this, this actually as tiny as it is, can be measured. And once again, De Broglie was proved correct not too long thereafter. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.